Hey, and welcome to Wild Seat. All right, hold on tight because this is about to get interesting. We're taking you back to the year 44, right in the middle of World War II. Precisely at that moment when your hands get sweaty and you pray that the pilot doesn't make a mistake. Two planes crash spectacularly into each other over the South Pacific. And behind them, like two knights in shining armor, come Hank Marlowe and Gunpei Ikari parachuting down as if they're in an action movie. They spot each other, and it's as if the showdown music from an old western starts playing in the background. There's a chase, adrenaline, and even a jungle involved. Our boy Hank, the American, is forced to stop at the edge of a cliff, like a scene from a soap opera. Gunpei, the Japanese, tries to attack him with his sword, but Hank risks it all and stops the sword with his hands. Gunpei tries again with a knife, and just when he's about to turn Hank into a skewer, a gigantic hairy hand appears. Yes, you heard that right, and behind it an XSL-sized gorilla head that roars as if it just woke up from a nap. Okay, let's leave the jungle mess for a moment and return to civilization. Here we have Washington, with a taxi stopping right in front of the White House. Out come two guys, Bill Randa, the head of Monarch, and Dr. Houston Brooks, who looks like he got lost in the rock and instead of a geologist, he seems like a spy. The boys have come to chat with Senator Willis. Brooks has some doubts about whether this is a good idea, but Randa reminds him that they are on thin ice and have no other choice. The senator, although he doesn't really believe it, lets them into his office. Randa and Brooks drop the bomb. They have found an island in the South Pacific where it seems like God left work halfway done, Skull Island, a place where ships and planes disappear as if by magic. Randa has a theory that the nuclear tests of 1954 were actually attempts to annihilate something on that island. The senator takes it as if they were telling him a fairy tale and leaves the office. But Randa and Brooks don't give up and keep insisting. There's a mission on the way to the island. They could join, they could discover things beyond your imagination. Brooks isn't sure what on earth they will find, but he's clear on one thing. Whatever it is, the Russians must not be the first to discover it. That convinces the senator who promises them that this will be the last time he helps them out. Randa adds that they will need military escort because, hey, they're not just going for a walk in the park. And from there, we move to a U.S. airbase in Vietnam where soldiers are preparing to return home now that they finally finished with that damned war. All right. In this new act, we meet Lieutenant Colonel Preston Packard's gang, Officers Glenn Mills, Earl Cole, Reg Slivko, and a guy named Relis. After a round of drinks, Packard returns to his lair, I mean office, where he receives a visit from Major Jack Chapman. Uncle Chapman already has a secure job lined up, but Packard, the eternal pessimist, believes that all he has done has been for naught. However, as night falls, Packard receives a call inviting him to Randa's shindig. Uncle Packard joins without thinking twice, as if he has been invited to the party of the year. On the other hand, in Saigon, Brooks and Randa hit the bars to look for a former Special Air Service captain to help them with the tracking. At the bar, they find our man James Conrad, earning a few bucks playing pool. The losers, annoyed, try to mess with him, but Conrad puts them in their place with the pool cue. Later, the three sit down to negotiate as if they were in a gangster movie. Conrad believes this little trip is high risk, so he asks for five times what they offer and an extra if they manage to return in one piece. They accept. But Conrad wants to know what he's up against, even though Brooks and Randa only tell him they need his expertise to explore rough terrain. We change the scene and go to Mason Weaver, a photojournalist, working in her darkroom. She receives a call informing her that she's been admitted into Randa's group, and she's over the moon with joy. When asked why she's so interested, she says that several sources have told her the same thing, and that makes her suspect they're trying to pull a fast one. Something's fishy here. A couple of days later in Bangkok, all the characters get together to board the ship. The soldiers are not very happy with this new trip, as they were looking forward to going home after the war. Weaver introduces herself to Steve Woodward, a NASA guy, and then to Packard, who doesn't like the anti-war vibe of her journalism. Once everyone is on board, the ship sets sail and the explorers gather to hear a talk from another NASA scientist, Victor Neves. The guy explains that the island is surrounded by a system of perpetual storms, 
which keeps it hidden from the world's view, but he says they should be able to cross it with Packard's military helicopters. Then he introduces Brooks and Randa, and a third scientist on his team, San Lin. Brooks then takes the mic, explaining that they are going to drop bombs to create vibrations that will help them map the island. What a party they're going to throw. Then it's Uncle Chapman's turn, who reveals that the storm is going to cut off all radio contact, that they're going to be alone, and that in three days, they have to meet at the north end of the island. That's the only safe way out for an unknown duration, so nobody can miss the rendezvous. When everyone has disappeared, Conrad and Weaver start snooping around the ship and bump into each other. Both smell something fishy about this expedition, and they also start to suspect each other. It doesn't take two days to get to where the island is, and the storm is worse than it looked. Randa wants to dive in headfirst, but Neves doesn't want any trouble. They leave the decision to Packard, who decides to go for it. All the soldiers and the civilian teams get on a fleet of helicopters and take off, flying beautifully at first. But when they get into the storm, things get ugly. They have to dodge lightning everywhere, and the helicopters keep shaking. But Packard is a veteran and manages to keep calm, leading his fleet with a speech about Icarus until they manage to get out of the storm. The island is a stunner, but there's no time to gawk at it because the plan is already in motion. After leaving all the civilians, except for Weaver, Randa, and Conrad, on the ground, the helicopters disperse to find the place where they have to drop the bombs. The radars quickly pick up the vibrations from the explosions, confirming Brooks's theory. The subsurface is emptier than a student's fridge. Everything is going swimmingly until suddenly one of the helicopters eats a flying tree and crashes, and another one is grabbed by a giant hand. The helicopter turns around and the soldier gets a glimpse of a giant monkey's face before being swallowed by it. Alarms start sounding when everyone looks up and sees the huge figure silhouetted against the sky. Kong, the big gorilla. At first he stands still, roaring at the soldiers, but as soon as they start shooting at him, the gorilla defends himself. The bullets don't even tickle him, so it's easy for Kong to move among the helicopters to knock them down, and he even crushes some soldiers who manage to reach the ground. One by one, Kong destroys all the helicopters, and he doesn't leave until there are none left flying. Due to the attack, all members of the expedition are scattered around the island. Today, folks, we have a gang of intrepid adventurers. Weaver, Neves, Slivko, Brooks, San Lin, and Conrad. Their goal? To head north, very close to the rendezvous point. But watch out. They're not all in the same boat. In some corner of the world, we find Chapman, the lone wolf. Although he did manage to send his tip off to Packard before his line was cut. Elsewhere, Packard runs into Rellis. And without wasting time, they manage to find Cole, Mills, Woodward, and a few more of the troop. They discover that this Randa guy is within striking distance, so Packard takes off to have a word with him. Pointing his gun at him, he asks him to tell what the hell is going on. And yes, Randa spills the beans, talking about monsters and theories that no one ever believed. Bombs, sleeping monsters, government cover-ups, and a Randa mad to destroy the beasts before they do the same to us. He asks Packard to bring proof, to rally the army, and he fires back that he is the army himself. Didn't see that coming, did you? Meanwhile, in Conrad's group, Slivko is doing his best to make contact with the others. Walking by a small lake, they run into a creature resembling a bison, but of XXL size. Slivko, scared out of his wits, points his weapon at it, but Conrad plays the wise elder and tells him no, the little creature won't hurt them. After giving them a once-over, the giant bison moves on. At the same time, Packard and his soldiers are having a tough time searching for Chapman and his special weapons. A little further on, one of their soldiers bites the dust impaled by a piece of branch, or so it seems until they realize that the branch is the leg of a truck-sized spider. They can't prevent Mills from falling into the spider's web, but they cut off its legs to free him while Mills fends them off with a knife. Once on the ground, the comrades open fire again and manage to take down the spider. Meanwhile, Conrad's team comes across some abandoned ruins. As soon as they enter, a bunch of armed natives surround them. Our guys point their guns at them, but before all hell breaks loose, a man appears among the natives. It's Hank, the pilot who fell there during World War II. After calming the tensions, the natives withdraw, and Hank becomes the tour guide of the ruins. 
In another part of the world, we find Chapman filling his canteen when out of nowhere comes Kong, that gigantic gorilla. The guy hides behind a rock and is astounded watching the ape drink water and then plunge his arm into the river, pulling out an octopus the size of a bus. The creature tries to coil itself around Kong's neck, but he responds by ripping off its tentacles and eating them. Finally, he leaves, dragging the remains of the octopus behind him. In the village, Hank brings our team up to speed. They'll be safe as long as they stay with the natives. A wall protects them, not from Kong, but from other monstrous beasts. Hank takes them to a prehistoric shipwreck, and inside, he shows them cave paintings. These paintings tell the story of the natives. Terrified of the monsters for millennia, suddenly some creatures began to protect them. Kong is the big cheese here and a god to the locals. He doesn't hit unless provoked. It wasn't Kong who killed Gunpei, but other monsters, the skull reptiles, giant lizards that awoke with the bombs. Kong normally keeps them in check, but the biggest one is dangerous. It was the one who killed Kong's family. Conrad changes the subject and tells Hank about the rescue team that will come in three days, but Hank maintains they won't be able to reach the northern tip of the island that quickly. At least not on foot, on the other hand. Packard's team traverses a swamp when they see a group of strange birds. They don't attack, but Packard takes one out anyway, scaring the rest. The soldiers are nervous, unsure if they will make it in time, but Cole asks them to trust Packard. Back with Conrad and his group, Hank tells them that he and Gunpei had started building a boat before Gunpei kicked the bucket. Now, the team will help him finish it to reach the rescue team in time. While everyone is on repairs, Weaver goes for a walk with the natives, taking pictures of them. Then she hears a noise behind the wall and goes to see what's happening. One of those bison-like animals has become trapped under a plane. She tries to help, but she doesn't have the strength to move an entire plane. Luckily, Kong appears and lifts it himself. He gives Weaver a look before leaving, seeming to approve of her actions. Meanwhile, Packard's team finds the bloodstain Kong left on a mountain. They now know the creature can be hurt and even killed. And while Conrad's team continues working on the boat, Chapman tries in vain to communicate by radio. What a surprise our good old Chapman gets! He decides to sit on what looks like a nice log, but it turns out to be a camouflaged giant creature. He shoots at it, scaring it off. But the noise causes another creature to appear, a skull reptile to be exact, which without much ceremony decides to gobble him up. Such an unfortunate fate. Night begins to settle in its place. In the village, while the others scratch their bellies, Conrad and Weaver are being all poetic observing the northern lights. Weaver tries to capture it with her camera, but her silly flashlight gives out. That's where our gallant Conrad comes in, lending his lighter, which is none other than a gift from his father, a World War II hero. In the folklore-filled scenery of the jungle, Packard's group is setting up camp. Randa, who saw it coming, tells Packard that his plan is total nonsense. But Packard retorts that if he doesn't like the way he's leading, he can leave. At dawn, everything is ready to set sail on the boat. Hank picks up Gunpei's sword from the grave, who had become his soul brother during their cohabitation. And so, everyone gets on the boat which, after sputtering a little, manages to start. Suddenly, they receive a call from Packard's team. They ask them to send a signal to locate them, and there goes Packard, sending it. It turns out they were close enough to pick them up, but the joy is cut short when one of those strange birds snatches Neves from their hands and flies away with him. There's no choice but to move on. A couple of hours later, the team gets off the boat to meet up with Packard and his boys. Conrad wants to leave, but Packard isn't willing. He still wants to look for Chapman, and Hank complains as going west is synonymous with stepping into the lion's den, where the skull reptiles live. Finally, Conrad ends up giving in but sets a condition. They must return before nightfall. The group sets off in search of Chapman, but along the way they come across the skeletons of Kong's parents. And despite Hank's complaints, Packard orders them to cross the massive grave. Then Cole drops his cigar and causes an explosion. A skull reptile pays them a visit, and everyone hides behind the giant bones. The skull reptile vomits up a skull with Chapman's dog tag and leaves. They think everything is safe, but when Randa's camera flash goes off, the skull reptile lunges at him and eats him. Poor Randa's luck. Everyone starts an attack, but it's challenging to hit. 
when the reptilian creature hides in the fog. Our hero, Hank, the handsome, manages to land a blow before being thrown away, and the beast takes out one of the soldiers like he's a bag of potato chips. The mess gets even uglier when the thing heads towards Weaver, but one of the guys has the guts to activate his flamethrower. Bam! But the big critter responds as if nothing happened, strikes the soldier, and causes a huge explosion. That's when our poor Slivko is left as stiff as a board, next to some gas barrels. Don't miss the weird birds that arrive flying while the soldiers shoot everything that moves. And there's our tough guy Conrad, picking up Hank's sword and a gas mask. He goes into the fray, dealing with the birds until he gets to Slivko. But there's the monster, ready for a new round. Fortunately, Superwoman Weaver appears to save the day. Boom. When they leave the area, Hank reminds Packard that all this is nonsense, and Conrad gives them the news that Chapman has kicked the bucket. Packard is as stubborn as a mule, still intent on going to the crash site to get explosives and take down Kong. The group tries to reason with Packard, but no, the guy doesn't listen. They pull out their guns and it seems like things are going to get ugly. But Conrad mediates and agrees to take the civilians back to the boat. Woodward, however, joins the military team. On the other hand, Conrad and Weaver decide to find a good spot from which to watch the river and the boat, and they get a visit from Kong. Weaver the Brave dares to touch his nose, and the giant doesn't seem to mind, although he bolts when he hears the soldiers' explosions. The rest prepare to return to the boat, but Hank joins Conrad and Weaver when he learns that they want to save Kong. Meanwhile, Kong is ready for a bout of fighting with the soldiers. He tries to escape from a circle of fire, and after a few moments of agony, he frees himself and squashes Woodward before collapsing. Holy cow, mate! So there they all are, eyes fixed on Kong and feeling as if they've screwed up royally. While Packard, the stubborn one, orders his boys to set the charges, Conrad, Weaver, and Hank stand their ground to put a stop to the madness. The atmosphere is so tense you could cut it with a knife, until Slivko steps in and points at Packard. It looks like the gig is up. But lo and behold, they hear a splash and find themselves faced with a giant lizard that makes Kong look like a toddler. Everyone starts running like the devil is after them, except Packard, who stays behind to finish off Kong. But he gets a rude awakening when Kong revives and squashes him like a bug. Kong throws himself into the fight with the lizard, but things are not going well. At the break of day, the gang arrives at the edge of the island. They send Weaver to fire a flare that Brooks can see while trying to buy a bit of time. Conrad and the soldiers start running when the lizard skull starts chasing them. Cole, the brave one, decides to stay behind to blow everything up, but the lizard flings him into the air with its tail. It seems like the end is near for the rest of the group, but then Kong reappears and starts hammering the lizard to oblivion. After a good few blows, Kong ends up tied up with some chains. It looks like the lizard is going to finish him, but the scientists come to the rescue, shooting at the reptile's skull. Between that and a flare that Weaver fires into the lizard's neck, they manage to distract it long enough for Kong to break free and start giving the lizard a good beating. And then, heroin Weaver falls into the water, but Kong doesn't think twice and dives in to save her, not before knocking out the lizard. But, surprise, the lizard comes back for more, grabbing Kong with its tongue. Kong cunning as he is, grabs the lizard's tongue and guts it. Weaver is safe and Kong leaves her on the ground where Conrad comes to check she's all right. They watch Kong walk away and then everyone gets on the boat to head home. In the final scene, we see Hank reunite with his family and Conrad and Weaver, who think they've been captured by the army. But it turns out it's just Brooks and San Lin who have found drawings of other giant monsters. But the adventure doesn't end here. I'll see you in the next one. Let's go.